This interview with Marlos Kuna was recorded on October 27, 2016. Don't miss her at Bellator 163 on November 4th. Steve Jewin, MMA Mania. All right, Marlos, you are now on with Steve Jewin of MMA Mania. Go ahead, Steve. It's a pleasure. How are you doing today? I'm good, Steve. And you? I'm great, thank you. I want to start out by giving you a compliment. I was at your fight, Invicta FC6 in Kansas City. You're the only woman I've seen go four rounds with Cyborg, and I still remember that fight to this day, so <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> now, you've got a fearsome opponent coming up soon here at Bellator 163, Talita Noguera. She's undefeated at 6-0. and What are your thoughts on her? She's a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and my last fight, I lost from an armbar, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a tough opponent to me. And, um, but the last fight also, I mean, I've been fighting for a long time, for, you know, more than 16 years, and sometimes it's hard to find the motivation. And, uh, after this loss, I got so much motivation that I, I only have one goal on uh, Friday the 4th, and that's to, to take her out to Lida. And uh, I have to take out uh, a world class of a world champion Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So that's a big task. And that gives me a lot of motivation and a lot of energy. And I actually, I cannot wait to step into the cage with her and show that I'm still a good fighter after all these years around. Since you mentioned motivation and your last loss, I want to go back to motivation because you didn't have to take that fight. Your opponent came in over six pounds above the weight limit and you still took that fight what made you decide to go ahead and do it when i uh when i became a champion the first time in my life i was 19 years old and uh it was in tokyo and it was an open weight tournament and there was a japanese megumi abushita and i believe how we do we, do we have the metric system here so i also have to calculate she was like i don't know like 105 LBS, something like that. And we also had, the heaviest was Gunarenko. She was from Russia and she was 330 pounds. So, you know, that's how I have been trained. And I, I fought Becky Levi, Levi, um, and she was 105 kilos. So that's like 220 to 231 LBS, I think. And um, so, like, seven pounds, what is seven pounds? But I actually, I felt it when we were in the cage that she was way heavier than I was. And I was there already. I mean, I had I, I did my training camp. I flew all the way there. I, uh, I had the jet lag. I had done the weight cutting. And if somebody's seven pounds overweight, I'm not going to walk away from that. I'm a fighter. And I was so mad at the girl that I was like, the only thing was going through my mind, like, I'm when I'm done with her. But I was the one in agony. <laughs> so I appreciate the heart to still take the fight and especially like you said, you're already trained, you flew all the way there. But given that I consider that fight an upset, is that something that you want to get back later on and hopefully actually have her meet the weight? Yeah, well, they, I, uh, they, I, I wanted them rematch. They asked me if I wanted to rematch. I immediately said yes, but then she declined. She said she would only do the rematch if she if it was for a title, and that kind of pissed me off again. Like I'm like, who do you think you are? <laughs> you don't make weight three times in a row. You don't, yeah, you don't respect the game, not Bellator, and, and not the fans. You know, you really do not understand how this works. You even call the shots. You have Bellator who asks you if you want to fight, then you fight. I mean, that's the way we Dutch are. You, you're not gonna whine about opponents. I know it's different now because. People, people look at your record and, you know, it's, but I'm from the, from the old school. You just show up and you fight. You know, Bas Rutten, he never uh, declined a fighter. Uh, fighters are respect like Ramon Deck as they always stood in a ring or in the cage and they fought. I mean, that's what you do. You don't become a fighter to, to pick your opponents because once you're a champion, are you really a true champion when you have not tested yourself? So I'm kind of, mad about it, but I believe in karma and she will have her own karma. And I have a really big task uh, ahead of me. I have to fight a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'm, I'm so not underestimating Talita. I mean, I'm really, really uh, uh, have, have something on my hands here. So, um, no, my focus is with November 4th and uh, I will win. I hope it will be on a submission. Normally I say uh, a KO, but it never happens, and then I win on a submission, so if I say this time a submission, I hope it will be on a KO. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. We've already heard you mention that it's been 16 years that you've been in MMA. Even though she's undefeated and she's a jiu-jitsu champion, do you think you have the experience advantage here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, she's a world champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but we can elbow, kick, knee, punch. That's something different, and she hasn't experienced that. Her uh, last fight in MMA was like 2013, so yeah, it, I, I have 30 fights in the MMA cage, so that's, that's a little bit different. On the other hand, I have no idea how she how she has progressed, or how her stand-up is now, how her grappling is. The only thing I could find was a um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fight of last year, so... I mean, it's a difficult task for me. For her, it's easy. She can study me. She knows. She knows. Yeah, she. You could see everything of me. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge to me. I agree with that big challenge too, because I have to write previews for every Bellator fight, and I kept trying to find video or background on Salida. And other than knowing that she was <laughs> undefeated, it's like, what is there out there? It's hard to scout her. Yeah, exactly. That was my, yeah, I was like, okay, there was this fight of 2013, but yeah, that's quite a while ago, you know, so yeah. And then I, at least I know I look good if you couldn't find it either. Yeah, well, I'm sure it'll be a tremendous fight, though. Talk to us a little bit about how your camp has been yeah. for this fight. Well, it, it, it has been really good. I, I have my own gym in Amsterdam, Argrip, and I've been trained by my partner, Homer. And um, normally when I'm having camp, I'm really big, uh, busy with my dieting and watching my weight and all, and I'm always stressed about that more than my opponent or whatever. But first I need to make the weight and then, then it's just a party to me. But um, I'm already... But I'm already below the uh, 70 kilos, and I was that already for like two weeks ago, so... It has been really relaxed for me, and uh, the only thing that gave me headache were the medicals, but they're done as well. So, yeah, no, I'm I'm feeling actually really good. Is making weight easier now than when you used to fight at Bantamweight? Because I, I think people need to remember you were a strike first Bantamweight champion. I don't think everybody always remembers that. Yeah, well, there's a reason why I don't fight at 135 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was hell. It was really it was hell. You know, it's one thing to make the weight, and that was that was already traumatic to me. But then we have to recover from it. And you know, when I was in the Misha Tate fight, my trainer was, was like telling me, "Yeah, you kick now, kick, give the low kick." But my, I, I had no energy in my body, like nothing. And then with the Liz Kamush fight, you know, I was on the ground. I couldn't, I just couldn't anymore. It was so hard for the only time when I felt good was uh, against Sarah Kaufman. And but then the the t- the time prior to the to the fight, then I I had the the most because I was uh, my nutritionist was doing all the elite uh, bodybuilders in the Netherlands, and he already said to me like Luz, you're like a I translate this really bad now or basically like you're like a creamy girl, you know this is not your weight you can make it you can make it once a year but not not more often than that and actually you shouldn't do it but I was like yeah. I just lost a uh, world title against uh, um, Cyborg, and now I'm being granted another world title fight, one weight plus uh, below it. Like that never happens to people. I have to do this. So he said, "Yeah, okay. Well, then, then I will help you." And then my breakfast sometimes was just two eggs, and I had to train on that. And it, oh, it was awful. So no, I will never go back to 135 anymore. And I'm feeling awesome at 145. I agree. I think it's the right weight class for you, but since you have faced Cyborg twice and they keep trying to make a fight for her at 135, you know as well as anybody how hard it is to get down. Do you think Cyborg is ever going to get to 135? Well, I think it's a very big uh, disgrace of the UC that they don't build a uh, division around her at 145. I mean, she has proven to be uh, attracting people who want to tune in to, to watch her fights. And then they come up with this catch weight at 140. I mean, come on, take us women in the sport seriously and give us more divisions. I mean, look at Bellator. They open up the 145. I don't have to make the 135. I mean, I can fight at my own weight. And uh, when I was fighting in ADCC the first time in 2005, there were only two weight classes. There was like uh, minus 70 and plus 70. So that's like 145. 
I mean, if you take women in the sport seriously, you give them more divisions and you will give Saarburg her own division. And uh, that's how I see it. And uh, I think in the end it, it will it will go there. But at this point, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm always feel a little bit ashamed that she really has to back to to, to get her have fights at 145. I mean, 145 is already hell for her. The last time I fought her at 145, after the fight, I heard somebody had seen her uh, making weight at the parking lot, and she fell down to the floor, and then her coaches uh, pulled her up at her arms, and they 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 uh, took her legs to make her keep on running. And it was 145, so when I heard she was doing 140, I really I was really afraid something would happen to her. Thank God it didn't. But um, no, I I think um, you she should be better than that. Well, I agree. I think they probably should just make a 145 class for her. But I've heard some people say the reason that they don't is because Bellator has all of the 145s other than her. They have already all the best featherweights. Oh, fuck that. I really do not believe in that. I mean, the division is deep enough. They they also said that first when they didn't want to have women in the UC. Oh, the division isn't deep enough. Well, you know how many women are now on the roster. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, you have to start somewhere. That no, that's nonsense. If the, if Gabi Garcia can find fights, <laughs> then Cyborg can fight fights. And since we're talking about the weight class and the uh, 145 pound prospects, you know, they, they could make a title for her and they could do that, but they could also make a title in Bellator. Do you want to be fighting for a title here sometime soon? Uh, it feels I'm a little bit superstitious. So I, uh, I'm fo- really focused on this fight. I'm, I don't want to underestimate my opponent like I did the last time because then I have to tap. But um, when I have won this fight, I hope they invite me to fight for the title. That will be awesome. And I think you'd have a fair argument because you'd have won three out of your last four and your only loss would be to somebody who didn't make weight. Yeah, well, I'd tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they're listening. So that, that'll that be their way. <laughs> <laughs> Now, with your long track record in the sport, going all the way back to Japan in the early 2000s, how much longer do you think you're going to be fighting? I take one fight at a time. And to be honest with you, I really want to have the Bellator belt. So that, that my, my eye is on that. And uh, I hope I get that. And when I get that, I will see further. But this is what... Now, the loss motivated me. And when I win this fight, the belt will motivate me. When I'm 40, I'm not fighting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so when, somewhere between now and 40, I quit. <laughs> Does the relationship with Scott Coker really help out here? Because I know you've known him from your strike force days, and now he's the president of Bellator. Does that make it easier for you to keep getting motivated to fight? Yeah. Uh, actually, what comes up now was when I was talking to George Thompson one time during the strike force era. And um, he said, like, uh, Scott, um, when he just started Strike Force, Scott had told him, like, I don't care if you win or lose. I just want you to put up a great show. Fight your heart out. And that was that is what always had stuck with me because Scott was a teacher or sensei himself, and he understands fighting. And uh, it was such a, a pleasure to, to fight in Strike Force when it was run by Scott. I mean, he was Carrie and Rich and all the people, and... It, it sounds weird because we're fighters and it should be like a business thing. But to me, like the family vibe, yeah, it's just nice if they 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 hospital and they nice to you and um, and they they value you as a fighter and they value the sport. And yeah, to me, that was a big uh, big pro for me to sign with Bellator. And I knew what he did with Strikeforce. I mean, Strikeforce was bought by the UC because they were beating them in the heavyweight division with the ratings, you know, so I know we have this vision and I know we can pull it off, so yeah, that was a no-brainer to me. And it certainly is producing big cards, memorable events, Scott's doing a great job, and this is going to be another one with McGeary and Davis in the main event, so what are your thoughts on those two fighters being on the top of this card? Yeah, I shall be honest with you, I have only been focusing on myself. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> so fine. I, I, I haven't been focusing anyone else but me so i uh, i can 
give you a really big story, but I will be lying and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Please skip the last question. No, that's fine. Yes, I, I think you have to focus on yourself. That's the only right thing to do, and you have to take Talita Noguera seriously because she's an X Factor right now. Like you said, with three years since she's last been seen, you have to be super serious about this fight. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you, uh, believe me, I'm, I'm fully focused. I do not underestimate her at all. And I'm feeling really good. So I think it will be, I think it will be a really good fight. Well, we really look forward to seeing that fight. November 4th, Mohegan Sun Arena, Uncasville, Connecticut, main card on Spike Television. And I always like to ask fighters this, but I assume with your long track record, I already know the answer. Is there any additional pressure being on TV or is it just natural for you at this point? No, you know, when you're in a cage, I don't care where the cage is <laughs> or if they're sitting five people outside or 25,000. In the cage, you're by yourself. You have the lights on you. You have your opponent in front of you, and you just have to deliver. So, no, that, I, I don't see it. Would you even say it's like tunnel vision at that point? It, all you can see is your opponent and nothing else? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a complete psychopath in the cage. <laughs> when, you know, when it's over, I, I, don't, I don't know what I've done. I really have to watch the fight back. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, yeah. I can never recall it, actually. It's always been a pleasure to cover your fights live or in person. I, I'm thrilled to talk to you again. I haven't seen you since that fight in Kansas City, but it seems like you're doing just as well now as you were back then. So my hat's off to you, and I want to give, uh, okay. give you this chance to plug anything you'd like before I let you go today. Well, I really want, yeah, I'm, I'm so bad at this. I just want to thank my sponsors and, uh, and all the people rooting for me. And I really hope there will be a big crowd showing up the fourth and people will tune in on Spike. And uh, I would love to hear some, uh, on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram of the fans. I would appreciate that. Well, I'm sure they will all be commenting both before and after and during this fight. So everybody tune in for Bellator 163, November 4th. Tickets probably still available, but don't wait. Go ahead and get them now. So, Marlus, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, too, Steve. It was a pleasure.